please. Everyone take your seats. Um, the penultimate session is about to start. And it's speech perception. And our first speaker is Judy Geren from the CNRS and Université Paris-Descartes. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for still being here. And it's like I know it's the last afternoon of the last day. So um, thanks for bearing with, uh, with me. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, today about a collaborative um, study that we have, um, we have just um, completed uh, together in collaboration with a group in Barcelona, so uh, Ruth Balaguer, uh, Efren Pons, uh, Elena Kulagina, and the first author, Anna Martinez, who cannot be here, so I'm um, presenting it on her uh, behalf today. So as we all know, um, learning language in particular, learning grammar, um, is an implicit process and one that has um, attracted lots of attention because it's supposedly uh, a really hard learning problem. Uh, there is, um, it it um, poses an inductive challenge. There are just potentially infinitely many generalizations. Uh, it's really you could pick up on any element, it's really hard to know what is it that you have to uh, start looking at uh, and learn about. And so there have been many proposals about how infants um, might anyway uh, be able to learn grammar, what are the underlying mechanisms. Uh, and now I'm going to focus on one that is uh, a relatively sort of new proposal. Uh, and I don't take credit for that, so the theoretical framework or the proposal actually comes from uh, Ruthie's uh, work. Uh, the idea being that there, um, in the speech signal, mi there might be cues that um, attract infants' attention to specifically relevant information. So although there is all that sea of potential things to learn out there, uh, attention um, is something that might guide this learning process through cues uh, available um, in the speech signal. And so the idea is to test whether um, attentional processes can guide infants' um, attention to, uh, to relevant information in the speech signal. Uh, so we have chosen to, uh, to look at uh, a particular rule that has uh, that has been studied a lot in the language acquisition domain, uh, in particular non-adjacent uh, dependency uh, learning. And so if you look at this English um, sentence there, and of course uh, you think about uh, lots of sentences with a, s a similar structure, um, then at the surface at least <clears throat> you can make a generalization such that you have an auxiliary is, then a verb which could change, there's a whole, the whole category of verbs that could be uh, placed in this position, and there is the ing ending, and so there is this non-adjacent dependency between the auxiliary is and the ing form, with the verb varying uh, potentially infinitely in between them. And so since the two elements between which the dependency holds are not adjacent, it is thought that this is something that's particularly challenging for learners because it's just not obvious that these are two elements that could have a relationship, uh, and so it's not obvious that you would pick this up. Um, and so in, in the, uh, the language acquisition literature, uh, learning of this, what I will call an AXB type of uh, regularity or pattern uh, has attracted a lot of attention. So now with the analogy uh, um, with the English example, uh, you have is and ing, which are fixed, and then the verb varies in between. So here you have A and B, which form a regularity. So pe uh, predicts bu um, at the uh, third position uh, with 100% certainty, but the element in between, the X element, varies. And so uh, infants have been shown to succeed uh, learning this regularity uh, only at around uh, between 12 and uh, 15 months, uh, so not um, so early. There are many other rules or regularities that are adjacent, which they can learn earn earlier, but this part, uh, particular type of non-adjacent dependency uh, takes quite a while to learn, at least behaviorally. So um, the, the question we were asking is whether we could boost learning this regularity uh, by somehow um, adding cues to the signal, to the input, such that, that they would attract attention to this relevant um, regularity, and we decided to use um, prosody, 
that is specifically pitch cues um, to guide infants' attention. So what we did was uh, test uh, infants between eight and 10 months, so they are younger uh, than the age at which inf infants have been documented to succeed in this task uh, in the literature. And so we ran um, two studies, uh, experiment one and two, where there is no additional cue, so just the same AXB type of regularity that people have been uh, working uh, with in the, in the literature, and we ran a behavioral study, uh, as well as a brain imaging study using near-infrared spectroscopy. I'm gonna talk uh, more about the methodological details. So as you can see, um, we, we just have uh, this AXB grammar, so there are uh, dependencies between the first and the third syllable uh, in these little sequences. And so this is our baseline. So this is what we know uh, people have not been able to demonstrate success with at eight, uh, between eight and 10 months. And so the crucial manipulation is that in experiment three and four, we now have added uh, increased pitch, higher pitch on the A and B elements, highlighting their dependency. So this is what the capital letters in the examples um, are supposed to um, indicate. And so again, uh, here as well, we have a behavioral as well as a brain imaging study. The rationale for running a brain imaging imaging study along with behavior was that it might be the case that behaviorally we don't see uh, learning, but maybe potentially looking directly at the brain, uh, we could find the effect earlier. So we hypothesized that if uh, attentional cues um, are really helpful, then either in experiments three and four, or at least in experiment four in the imaging study, we might find learning. Um, although in experiments one and two where there are no attentional cues we want. And so um, just a few methodological details. Remember, uh, all of the infants are between eight and 10 months old French exposed infants. And so for the behavioral studies, so experiments one and three, we use the head turn preference procedure using a very standard uh, familiarization test type of procedure. So in experiment one, infants are exposed to, uh, for several minutes, to lots of these sequences uh, implement using two um, AXB frames. So there are two AB pairs, but the X is very uh, a lot in between them. There are 18 different X items. So they listen during the familiarization to, they listen to lots of these sequences that conform to this regularity. And then in the test phase, we test them on uh, items that follow this rule. So now the X uh, syllables are novel, they're new, uh, so they have not heard the sequences before, uh, but they conform to the um, AB non-adjacent dependency, and we also have sequences that violate uh, the rules, so the A and B items no longer appear in these um, edge positions. So these are the reddish violation items there. Um, and so remember the prediction is that uh, infants might not succeed uh, on this task. But now if we add pitch cues, so this is what um, the uh, highlighting illustrates here, uh, the A and B items have a higher pitch, but otherwise everything is the same, so they get the familiarization, then they're tested on rule-following and rule-violating items, uh, and we measure looking times in a standard way. Um, so for the imaging part, uh, we use near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with this, this is uh, an imaging modality that measures uh, the hemodynamic response. So not directly the neural response like EEG, but more like MRI, the hemodynamic correlates. And so given the, the needs uh, of this imaging modality, we could no longer have this familiarization and then test type of paradigm we used um, a block design in which we exposed infants um, to uh, what I will call the rule blocks. So rule blocks contain, as you can see on the box car below, they contain lots of different items, somewhat like the familiarization in the, um, in the behavioral part, lots of different items uh, that conform to the AXB regularity. Uh, but we also had what you can see in red, the uh, no rule blocks. So we, there what we did was, and this will give you maybe a better idea. So what we did there was to use the same syllables, exactly the same syllables as those appearing in the rule blocks, but now we shuffle them around. So they appear in the same position with the same frequency, uh, and in general they op appear with the same frequency. So overall the input has the same statistics, except that they are not arranged in this um, uh, AXB non-adjacent dependency um, uh, rule. And so, of course, here as well, in experiment two, we had these sequences without 
Um, so with flat prosody, no uh, addition of a pitch cue, and uh, in experiment four, we raise the pitch of uh, the first and third syllable uh, in both the rule and the no rule blocks, and we predicted that that would guide infants' attention to the relevant uh, rule in the rule blocks where it holds. Uh, the whole thing was synthesized, so let me make you listen to a rule block and then a no rule block. So you get the idea. This is, uh, so you could hear kind of the pitch manipulation. This is, it kind of like sounds like the voice is somehow not very stable, but that's actually the pitch manipulation. And so this is the no rule condition. Bugato, peshidu, bobuto, peshishu, bopedi. And so uh, we use near infrared spectroscopy. It looks like this. This is a baby sitting on a caregiver's lap uh, watching a silent uh, video while, while we are measuring. And what you can see here is the localization. So NIRS does not have the inverse problem. Localization is precise. And so we targeted uh, the, the temporal, frontal, parietal areas, those that you can see um, here on the left hemisphere and symmetrically uh, on the right hemisphere, obviously. So these are the language areas. So this is, uh, these are locations that um, we expected to be involved in this task. And so try to keep this localization in mind because this is how I will plot uh, the results. Um, okay, so remember we have these four conditions, uh, behavior, near, speech, no pitch. So I'm gonna come to the results, first looking at the behavioral results. Um, this is the no prosody condition. So remember here we pre predicted no learning. And indeed, this is what we find. Uh, infants in uh, the test do not look longer to the violations or uh, to the regular uh, rule following test items. Uh, there is no difference. So this is when there is no pitch uh, cues added. And this is exactly what we expected because from the literature, it seemed like this behaviorally, these rules could not be learned before um, 12 months. So indeed, at eight, between eight and 10 months, they don't succeed. But now, uh, once pitch is added, um, so the graph is a bit, like it looks like the effect is small, but simply it's just the plotting is not really great. Um, essentially, a, as you could expect, they look longer at those sequences that violate the expected rule. Um, behaviorally, right? So this is when we added uh, uh, the pitch cue. So actually, uh, we could find evidence uh, for the pitch cue boosting learning, even behaviorally. So how about the brain data? Um, this is uh, experiment number uh, two, that is the nearest experiment where there was no pitch manipulation. And so the slide is busy, let me take you through the slide. Um, so what you see on the left is the left hemisphere, what you see on the right is the right hemisphere, each little subplot is, is a measurement point, a channel, and so uh, we measure uh, two things, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Oxygenated hemoglobin, the reddish curves is what you should focus on because they uh, show a larger effect. The bluish curves are deoxygenated hemoglobin. Typically they, are, they show a weaker effect. And so each little channel plot gives you um, time in seconds uh, averaged across all the blocks of a given condition. So remember I made you listen to a part of a block, so that goes on for about 20 seconds, and so, and it's repeated four times, and so this is the grand average uh, of all four blocks over time, and this is the concentration change, once again, of oxygenated, deoxygenated hemoglobin. Uh, and so the conditions are rule pinkish, I don't know how well you can see the colors, but I think it does come through pretty well. So just focus on channel 17, for example, that shows this um, canonical hemodynamic response. Oxyhemoglobin is increasing, deoxyhemoglobin is decreasing, but as you can see, there is no difference between the conditions. So they did process the stimuli. There is a hemodynamic response, but it's the same for both conditions. So the pink line for the rule and the red line for the no rule condition or blocks just gives rise to the same hemodynamic response. Without pitch cues, there seems not to be a difference, although there is processing overall. Uh, but now what we find once we add the pitch cues is a much, so this is the same layout as before, and as you can see in almost all of the temporal, temporal parietal channels, um, say we could focus on three or six, uh, we have a huge advantage for the rule condition. So it looks like when there is something to extract, some regularity to extract from the stimuli, indeed uh, we find a much um, larger hemodynamic response. 
Uh, so to sum all, all this up, um, for those of you who work uh, in, with um, imaging in infants, one of the first points I would like to emphasize, which is not a theoretical one, but for once we found that um, behavioral results and neural results converged, which we were really happy about, and that's not, um, not necessarily always the case. Uh, but more importantly, from our theoretical perspective, um, we have managed to um, show that adding pitch cues, which of course, um, in a certain sense, in natural language, is one of the, the important cues that carries prosody. Um, so something that, uh, although this specific configuration you don't find in natural languages, uh, pitch manipulation or pitch variation is indeed an important trigger uh, in the, nat the natural language uh, speech signal that infants get. Um, one way in which um, we could conceive of or think about the role that prosody plays in language acquisition uh, is that it, mi it might help highlight um, important um, elements in the speech signal between which relevant, grammatically relevant linguistic uh, regularities might hold and attract infants' attention to these regularities. So that would be, uh, in addition to other mechanisms, other bootstrapping type of mechanisms that have been proposed in the literature, uh, it might also be the case that attentional processes uh, play a role, and this is something that is not very often emphasized. So in this, in this sense, um, the claim is that uh, we, one thing that uh, is rarely considered but we would, that we think is important to think about is how the speech signal uh, might drive uh, young infants' attention to what is important. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for questions, especially questions from junior scholars and questions in the back. Okay. Yeah. Hi. This is a really beautiful set of data, but I wanted to bring us back to the, the problem cases that you started out with, right? These, uh, these cases in natural language, like the dependency between the auxiliary and the ing, right? Um, so what we know about these, that these function words resist pitch acts and they resist stress, right? So it was a bit unclear to me how the, the idea of, of basically stressing the elements that, are, that have a codependency can, can help in learning in these kinds of environments. And I want to propose an alternative, which is that it's not so much highlighting the, dependent, like the codependent elements, but rather what might matter is pitch alternation. So the content word in the middle, like, you know, like, you know, is singing, the content words actually do bear stress. They, they really attract stress, unlike the, the, these function words. Right, yes, so I, indeed, this, this definitely is true that in that specific example, of course, function words or morphemes cannot be highlighted by stress. Uh, in a certain sense, from the perspective of the more general um, model that um, my collaborators are proposing uh, on attention, the fact that it's, it's um, pitch or not pitch is not in itself uh, the most important thing, but rather there is there's going to be something that um, attracts attention. So in this particular um, paradigm, we use pitch simply because it's very, very easy to manipulate. Um, I'm guessing, so, but that's uh, how to say that's ne that needs to be proven empirically. My own take is that, um, for example, for the dependency I have, um, I have shown, um, frequency or other things might, um, you know, might be um, attentional cues or cues. Um, so yes, I do agree with you. Now, of course, for prosody more generally, it's the, obviously it's not absolute pitch, not that something is high in itself is what matters, but that, that there are relevant relative differences and the alternation. Nevertheless, I do think that, um, again, the, um, the theory, the attentional theory behind this is not mine, so I cannot um, claim with certainty, but I do think that um, in the original proposal, um, highlighted, so higher pitch means highlighted element, and this is what attracts attention, uh, and so that it is important, so it's not um, what, what you, you attract the attention to uh, is actually important. It's not necessarily that uh, the case that you can define things in relation to that then, as you were suggesting. But again, um, I think that still needs to be empirically um, investigated further. Hi, so I actually had the same comment about the, the functional morphem, but so I wanted to, to, I would like to propose two possible uh, interpretations. So one is that uh, when we use flat speech, it sounds very robotic. So one possibility is that maybe 
adding some variation makes it more natural, maybe easier to process. And another possibility, and I, I'd like to, th so that's really my question. Do you think really the attention is, at so you attract attention really to the uh, edges or maybe to the, to the whole sequence? So it could be that having variation is, is attracting attention to, to the sequence more than the yeah. actual movements. Right, so um, the answer to the first question is that actually if you remember in the, um, uh, in the nearest manipulation, the no rule sequences also have pitch. It's just that what they highlight carries no regularity. So it's not that those are flat. So there is the fact that there is just, you know, variation, well, that's there also for the no rules. So in that sense, uh, that is taken care of. Uh, but I, uh, yes, but beyond that, for your second question, I do agree with you that one needs to understand what domain this thing delineates. And I think uh, at this point, so uh, these, you know, these data don't um, speak to that in themselves. Um, so that will, you know, we will re need to further investigate it. But I, I do take the point. I, I do think that that's, um, that's an open question. Let's thank the speaker. So the next speaker is Daniel Swingley from the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, uh, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing with an undergraduate at Penn uh, named uh, Josh Norielian. Um, yeah, that's in there. Uh, my talk is about how infants start learning language, and I will define learning as how you turn experience into knowledge. Okay, what is language experience? Well, uh, speech for most languages in the presence of an infant who can hear it uh, in some environment, right? Uh, so these are the ingredients. Uh, these get passed through some capabilities of the infant and the result is knowledge. When we're talking about infants of uh, less than 12 months, then the main knowledge outcomes that we're interested in are something about speech perception, <laughs> word learning, and uh, a little bit of combinatorial stuff of potential relevance to syntax. Here, I'm going to focus on speech perception. Uh, phonetic categorization is a part of speech perception that famously is a part of the change that uh, infants go through as they're developing uh, uh, competence in their native language. Uh, infants get better at making dis differences between speech sound contrasts that their language presents and worse at ones that their language does not present. So you would expect that a four-month-old uh, growing up in Spain would be able to perceive the difference between the Catalan vowels e and e, but by 12 months it seems that uh, Spanish learners will fail to make that distinction. And this has been shown for a number of different kinds of distinction, and that is the phenomenon that we want to try to explain. For uh, the past 25 years or so, we've had a consensus model of how this works, and here's the model. Uh, when infants hear speech, they divide it into a sequence of consonants and vowels, and they project each one of those into a domain-specific similarity space, a perceptual space. Within this space, instances of a given sound are similar to one another and distinct from other sounds. And infants have a domain general capacity for clustering things that appear in distributional clumps, and then assigning new instances to those clusters. And so as a consequence of this, infants more or less automatically will begin to assign new tokens to native language categories. So that's the idea. And there have been laboratory demonstrations of this phenomenon in which uh, materials, either visual ones or auditory ones, are presented with the relevant distributional characteristics. And it appears that under some circumstances, infants are capable of uh, detecting the distributional patterns such that they can be sensitized to a distinction between different categories where the categories were defined distributionally. So, we're done, right? Uh, we've solved it. Um, we can go work on word learning or theory of mind, whatever. Um, uh, we don't have to worry about this problem anymore. Um, I thought so uh, for a while. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, I want to take a step back and think about the research pathway that I've just walked you through. Here's how it works uh, in this case, and I think in other cases as well. Uh, the scientist uh, imagines the language environment uh, and designs a, uh, a perfect mini version of it, and then in the lab tests whether infants have some sensitivity to that difference that was uh, uh, exemplified in the stimuli. And when they do, uh, what we can conclude, or what we do conclude, is that the information that infants revealed access to helps with language learning. And I think this is extremely important. We need to be able to do this. If we're going to estimate what infants' capacities are, we need to do this kind of clean uh, uh, test that lets us evaluate these capacities. Sometimes infants succeed, sometimes they fail, and that, that difference is an important one. It doesn't tell us everything, though, because sometimes uh, our vision of what the infant's experience is like might not be accurate. And uh, uh, when we conclude that some information source helps with language acquisition or whatever problem we're trying to uh, specify, um, the amount of help is not really clear from this kind of experiment. It's hard to quantify. So uh, uh, if we want to have a quantitative theory, then I think we need to uh, work on that. Um, if we go back to learning a little bit, um, I think in, in my area, infant uh, uh, early language perception and so on, um, we've uh, spent a good bit of time working on the capability part uh, and the knowledge part, but a little bit less on the experience part. And so I'm going to talk about that. I'm say, how can we characterize the experience of infants learning language quantitatively if possible? I will be talking about how infants learn vowel categories, and so what we need is a way to quantitatively characterize vowels. And the quantitative characterization I've selected is the one that most phoneticians use, which is to measure vowels in terms of their formants. Formants are resonances of the vocal tract that are produced in the speech signal by moving your mouth parts around. Um, I think that's all we really need to know uh, for this. Uh, uh, you can distinguish vowels for the most part by measuring their first and second formants. There are plenty of details, but to a first approximation, that's not too bad a way to do it. So let's look at some formant measurements of vowels. Uh, here is a plot of uh, uh, first formant. So for, uh, second formant is on the x-axis. Uh, first formant on the y-axis. So phoneticians put the last name first and the first name last. You're familiar with this principle. Um, I've, what I've done here is I've colored in each vowel instance by its true category as rated by listeners. So uh, uh, what you can see here is that there's a lot of spread in the instances of each token. Um, it doesn't look like the little clumps I put in my slide uh, before. It looks more like an explosion at a gumball factory. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't appear that vowels are emerging uh, uh, in any transparent way when we look at this mother's speech to her 10-month-old. So we thought there's really something wrong with this mom. Um, let's look at others. Maybe they're better. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so in the upper left, we see examples from a Spanish speaker. Spanish has a five-vowel system. Um, it doesn't look that much cleaner. Uh, on the upper right, we see another uh, English mom talking to her baby. And then the lower two cases are um, uh, plots of the same sort that come from adult-adult conversation. And in all of these cases, it doesn't really look like the categories are presenting themselves easily for inspection. And indeed, if we try to cluster them using various kinds of clustering models, like unsupervised clustering models, like hierarchical cluster analysis, uh, they fail uh, miserably. Uh, uh, we can see an example of such a failure on the left uh, graph here. Uh, the true uh, answers are given by the colors and the derived answers given by the analysis are, given, are, are, are shown uh, as gray polygons. What you would want is for the polygons to align with the colors, and they really don't. Uh, we can um, uh, demonstrate how poor the fit is by uh, rerunning the analysis with tiny portions of the data removed. So if we rerun the clustering analysis with half a percent of the data removed, uh, with that half a percent uh, randomly determined, nine different times we see the result over on the right where even with this tiny manipulation in the data set, we're seeing uh, vast differences in the morphology of the clustering uh, result. What that means is the cluster is trying to cluster things that don't have clusters. Okay? So uh, it appears uh, that we have a poverty of the stimulus problem. That is to say, the experience as we've measured it that the infants are getting is not adequate 
to solve the problem that they appear to be solving. Um, Uh-oh. Uh, so here are some things that we might uh, 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 respond with. One possibility is that we're measuring the wrong thing. So maybe infants don't uh, hear formants. Maybe they hear something else. And it could be that if we were to measure other things, that the clustering problem would uh, trivially resolve itself. This is something we're working on. I can talk about that a bit later if you like. Um, another possibility is that we're measuring all of the instances, and maybe babies only pay attention to the good ones. So it could be that the teaching signal presents some sounds that are both better instances for teaching and more salient to babies. Uh, Franz Adrians and I have looked into that a little bit, and we've seen some advantage in, in clustering over tokens that uh, are rated as being emphasized by uh, native speaker listeners. It helps a little bit, but doesn't help very much. A third possibility is that our theory is wrong, uh, and that's what I'm going to focus on here. Um, it could be that actually infants aren't learning vowel categories by clustering over individual tokens. Maybe they're doing something else. And the something else that I have proposed, along with others, for example, Naomi Feldman, uh, is that they're actually learning word representations or proto-word representations and clustering over those representations rather than over uh, individual instances of speech sounds. So here's how that might work, and here's how I've uh, implemented this uh, in my own modeling. So we take uh, our Spanish example. We start from words that infants are hearing often on the kind of intuition that an, if an infant hears a, a word very frequently, the infant will begin to recognize that as a familiar unit and store it in memory. Uh, so they hear a word like pájaro, which means bird. They hear that a lot, uh, so they probably have some representation of it. They hear esto and esta a lot, so they have some representation of it. In the modeling that I'm going to show you, we're assuming that they have no idea how vowels are different from one another at the start. So that means, but, but I'm going to assume that they do know about the consonants. And there's some evidence that consonants are more categorically perceived. Um, again, we can talk about relaxations of that assumption in a moment. Um, so the word pajaro is going to be represented as uh, p, vowel, uh, ch, vowel, r, vowel, okay? We take all of the instances of words, whether they're pajaro or not, that fit that pattern and for the first vowel, we get the average of their first and second formant across all instances. And it's that average that enters into the analysis. Okay? For the second vowel of pajaro, same thing. For words like esto and esta, which are only different in their vowels, we will just average over those os and as. Because the, by hypothesis, the baby doesn't have a way to tell them apart. Then we're, so we're going to cluster over that. Uh, here are some results. On the left, we have the uh, Spanish analysis by types. That's the one I was just telling you about. On the right, we have the analysis that I showed you before, which is um, um, grotesquely uh, ineffective. Uh, and you can kind of see that uh, here on the left, the, uh, the categories that the analysis has found are lining up better uh, with, the, um, with the truth. Uh, here is a quantitative representation of that. On the, um, uh, in the columns on the x-axis are the different true vowels, and the categories that we found are the, the rows. We're just counting things and plotting them uh, uh, as dots whose size varies with amount. Uh, a perfect solution would have all of the data on the diagonal. What we find here in the types analysis is about 90% of the data is on the diagonal, and uh, that's much better than the tokens analysis, which, as I said, is catastrophic. So uh, is that true just for Spanish? Well, we're, we're looking into doing the same thing for English. So here, I won't go through the procedure. It's the same as for the Spanish, more or less. Uh, uh, the types analysis for the first of our moms from the Brent corpus, uh, it's not perfect. It's not as good as the Spanish analysis. English presents a harder problem. Uh, but we can see that there are some successes and some failures. So the, the model does pretty well in finding e in the upper left. Um, um, it does tend to collapse i and e, for example. But it does do better than the tokens analysis. Uh, here's uh, a similar result from the other Brent mom that we looked at. Um, quantitative results, we can see that uh, about 70% of the data are on diagonal for mom F1, about 80% for mom W1 in the types-based analysis, the analysis by words, uh, and performance is much worse uh, on the analysis by individual tokens. So as in Spanish, we find the same thing. Uh, we wanted to look at a larger data set, so we looked at uh, the um, uh, tens of thousands of vowels from the Buckeye corpus, uh, looking at four different women in their 20s in free conversational speech. Again, similar procedure. Um, here we found that the analysis was much poorer overall, uh, poorer both for types and for tokens. 
Um, so there is an advantage for types, but it might be a bit of a Pyrrhic victory because the, um, the categorization is fairly poor. We wondered if this were about um, something that is peculiar to, um, a di well, a difference between infant-directed speech and adult-directed speech. One difference between the two is that infant-directed speech tends to be slower. So here we have distributions of vowel duration across our different samples. Uh, the blue curves here represent uh, uh, the rightward shifted distribution of infant directed vowels. So we redid the um, analysis of the adult buckeye corpus looking at only the upper half of the tokens in terms of duration and the result does turn out to be better. So vowels are easier to cluster if you're looking at the longer ones, which makes sense, right? That's uh, intuitive. Um, this is a result from one of the four moms. I said not moms, well, she might be a mother. She's a, uh, not talking to a baby in any case. Um, uh, this was neither the best nor the worst of the four. It's just representative. Uh, we can see on the left, uh, we're getting about 65% on diagonal, and on the right, it's uh, substantially poorer. So for seven out of seven of our talkers in two different languages, vowel category discovery is better when you start from average word statistics than when you start from the raw signal. So we know developmentally from experiments that infants learn words and uh, phonetic categories around the same time developmentally. So these might be coordinated processes in the sense that um, beginning to develop the lexicon might be necessary for learning phonetics. You might need one for the other. There are many things that we don't know. So one thing we don't know is whether words or proto words, word forms, are more active in this process when infants know what they mean. Uh, certainly, statistically, it should help you. If, if, you don't know that, if you do know that wheel is the round thing and whale is the giant fish, then uh, you're not going to average over those vowels. You're going to know that they're different. You can partition them by semantics, perhaps. Um, it also may be that when infants know what a word means, they pay more attention to it, and it might be more active in this process. And this is something we could look into uh, experimentally, I think. Another thing we don't know is how infants find words in the first place. Um, I have some ideas about that. I don't really have time to talk about them, but I, I, it probably it involves uh, hearing things that, uh, that achieve some criterion of similarity to the infant, like chunks of speech that begin to sound familiar uh, because they're hearing them or they perceive they're hearing them again and again, and then they may store those away, and those might be active in this process. So going back to my conversation about methods, um, uh, it seems to me that uh, if we want to have quantitative theories of learning, especially in a domain like this, where we have some idea of what the outcome is and what it is that we're trying to uh, explain. Uh, uh, getting these quantitative theories right is gonna depend on measurement of children's experience. Our intuitions about children's experience might not be very accurate. I think you have to look. It's hard, but you have to do it. And uh, uh, when we do look carefully at the details of children's experience, it may lead us to having different and possibly more accurate theories. Thank you. Questions? Do you want to respond? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really uh, exciting. Uh, so I, ha I have a, a general question, speculative, I guess, at this point, about um, providing the consonant consonantal frames. Uh, do you think it's just simply providing more information is always better. So as you said, if they knew the semantics, if they could figure out whatever additional stuff you can give them helps, or is it specifically co-articulation co and whatever other phonotactical regularities you could get by providing the frame? So to put it empirically, if you provided other information and not the consonant consonantal frame, would you have gotten better um, clustering as well? Um, well, um, co-articulation only hurts. So uh, if you don't know how to undo it, right? Um, if you take the same Spanish data and you randomize the assignment of vowels to their words, the clustering gets much better uh, because co-articulation makes things more messy, right? Um, uh, I, it's, it's certainly not uh, fully realistic to imagine that infants can correctly perceive the consonants as they were transcribed in our data. Um, uh, what I can say is that for Spanish, one of the things that we tried is assuming, like rerunning the model with the assumption, for example, that they don't perceive voicing at all. Um, and it doesn't have that much of an impact on the, on the results, or that they don't represent place of articulation at all. So you're conflating things that are you know, fairly readily distinguishable to us. 
Um, again, that doesn't change things very much. I haven't done this exhaustively. I think the right thing to do is to have a more accurate representation of speech overall. Um, it turns out that that's a bear of a problem as speech engineers have been beating their heads against it for a long time. I mean, we're starting to beat our heads against it too. Um, uh, but at least we, you know, we can tinker with the digital models that we have and um, um, introduce noise in various ways. Uh, we can evaluate how much of a difference it makes. At least in the case of Spanish, uh, disrupting the consonant knowledge quite a lot doesn't interfere with the advantage of types over tokens. We have time for a short question. In the meantime, can the third speaker come to the front? Uh, so a short question, do you think the, so you're using the consonant information to learn about the vowels, now how do you learn about the, the consonants? Do you think it's the same type of mechanism or something completely different? Um, I, I think they would learn about consonants almost exactly the same way. That's, I'm just going to, I think that's probably true. Um, I think there is no evidence for it, but I think it's probably true. I, I do think that, I mean, consonants are, are a little bit more available in the signal. They're a little bit less variable across languages. They're a little bit more available in the signal. I, I've started with vowels because for consonants, at least with vowels, we kind of know what to measure. And with consonants, we don't know what to measure. Exactly, so in that sense, they are a much more complicated uh, problem. My, my, my impression is that, for instance, for computers, they're a more difficult problem than vowels. But maybe I'm wrong. Yep, you're wrong. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> so let's thank the speaker. Oh, do I swap the projector? Can, Can we get some help switching to um, the main laptop? Oh, I remember. Okay. This should work now. Oh, okay, so we're halfway there. There we go. So and the last speaker of the session is Evelyn McKeer from Goldsmiths London. Okay, so we know from uh, previous literature that uh, newborns have quite sophisticated speech and language learning skills uh, from day one. We also know that um, there are areas of the frontal and temporal uh, lobes of the brain that activate in response to language, even in newborns. This is interesting because it is similar to the network that activates uh, to the same stimuli in adulthood. But it's not because it's present at birth that it is necessarily experience independent or does not develop uh, with experience. Um, because we know that babies can hear from about the 24th gestational uh, week. So in roughly the third trimester of, of uh, pregnancy, the baby's lying there, mostly surrounded by, well, all, all surrounded by liquid, um, and hearing mostly what comes from within the mother's body. So the baby can hear the mom's heart rate and blood flow, but more interestingly, from uh, a psychological perspective, they can also hear the mother's voice. Um, and we know that newborns show a preference for the voice of their mother over the voice of another woman, and that they show a preference for the, the language that the mother was speaking uh, when pregnant as opposed to another language. So this suggests that not only the fetus can hear, but that the fetus can learn, and that uh, all the basic of voice and language processing is starting even before birth. 
We also know that at birth, uh, the brain activates differently to the language they were hearing in utero versus another language, which suggests again that uh, in utero, while receiving the, the input of the mother's language, the, the brain activation for language is being shaped to some degree. So keeping that in mind, I became very interested in the hearing babies of deaf mothers. Um, because if these babies um, are hearing, so they have full hearing, they're lying there in the third trimester, and they're hearing blood flow and heart rate, uh, but if the mother's using mainly sign language, then they're not really receiving uh, this language input or as much of this language input as the babies of hearing mothers. Um, so that was how my interest started in this population, but then the more I became interested in them, the more I realized that they were interesting for so many other reasons. Uh, one of them is the fact that they develop a really special case of bilingualism, where one of their languages is spoken and one of their, language, their, their languages is signed. So they're learning two languages in completely different uh, sensory modalities. And another uh, interesting point about them is the importance of visual attention in their early interaction with the mom. So there can't really be any communication in sign language without uh, prior visual attention between the mom and baby. Um, so I, I set up this project, um, I think eight years ago now, where I started studying this population um, started studying lots and lots of things about them, and today I'm going to present some uh, FNIRS data uh, about brain activation to language. And here in terms of language, I mean spoken language, and I've already explained my interest in, uh, in spoken language activation in this population. But I was also interested in sign language. Uh, because we know that uh, from the adult literature that sign language is processed very similarly in the brain of fluent signers as spoken languages are. And this suggests that these language, these classical language areas, they're not so much interested in the sound of language as much as in the code of language. Um, but we don't really know how that starts. Is that an adaptation over years and years of using this code, or is it something that starts from, from, uh, from birth, basically? Um, so in uh, the study I'm going to present, I was uh, trying to answer these questions, um, and here I'm presenting data from uh, 60 babies from three different groups. So a third of them are English uh, exposed monolinguals. A third are uh, my exotic group of bimodal bilinguals. So these are babies uh, all with a deaf mom, most of them with also a deaf dad, um, and they're exposed to British sign language as well as English. And then to account for the fact that these babies are bilinguals, I'm also uh, presenting data from what I call here unimodal bilingual, so spoken bilinguals, uh, babies who are exposed to English uh, as well as Spanish or Catalan or anything else, we, uh, any other combination we could find in London. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that you did already explain uh, the FNIRS technique, so I can skip over a bit of the methods here. Um, so the hypotheses that I was testing here were uh, one about spoken language, one about sign language, but they're very related. Um, I was proposing that because of their lack of experience or their reduced experience of auditory spoken language, then I would observe less lateralization for language in this group and less activation uh, in language areas for spoken language. On the other hand, I was predicting the other, the other way around for sign language, that this group would show more activation in language areas for sign language and also more left lateralization for sign language. Um, so now, it, so this is the results that we uh, got for uh, spoken language. So if you start at the top uh, left with monolinguals, 
Um, you can see that, so the red channels are channels that show a significant increase of oxyhemoglobin in response to uh, spoken language. So you can see that this is quite a widespread network that involves the language areas of the inferior frontal cortex and the posterior temporal uh, cortex as well. Um, the same was also the case in unimodal bilinguals, so my spoken bilinguals. Um, but what came as a big surprise here was the amount of right hemisphere activation in this group. So it's not something that we were predicting. Um, and then when looking at the bimodal bilinguals, this so far fitted the prediction. So there was a bit less activation in language areas and especially in the inferior frontal uh, gyrus. Um, so now if we look at sign language, so if we start again with monolinguals at the top left, so you can see that as we were predicting, there's a bit less activation in language areas uh, in response to sign language, uh, and uh, especially in the inferior frontal uh, area. Um, and then when we look at the unimodal bilinguals, the spoken bilinguals, um, I was really surprised to see that their right lateralization was still there for sign language. So I found that extremely surprising because they've never been exposed to sign language, so they're seeing that for the very first time. And the fact that they experience two spoken languages is shaping their brain activation for sign language when they see it for the first time. Um, and another surprise came when we looked at the bimodal bilinguals who, again, a bit like they were showing for spoken language, they're showing reduced activation uh, in language areas and again uh, in the inferior frontal gyrus in particular. Um, so when we looked, uh, we took a close-up look at these two language areas, so uh, with an interest in looking at lateralization and group differences especially. So when we looked at the inferior frontal gyrus, um, it was interesting to see that there was left lateralization, which is often found for language activation. But what was surprising here was that this was there regardless of the modality and regardless of the baby's experience of that modality. So it suggests there that it is not about uh, having experience of these stimuli as a communicative system that creates this left lateralization. On the other hand, when we looked at the posterior temporal language area, here we found a significant interaction between group and lateralization. Um, and we were predicting left lateralization, at least in monolinguals, but that's not what we observed. So both the bimodal bilinguals and the monolinguals were non-lateralized in response to language in this area. And then our unimodal bilinguals were showing a significant right lateralization for both language modalities. Thank you very much. Um, so you might look at uh, these data here and these ones here in uh, bimodal bilingual, this reduced activation, and think of these babies as deprived of language or, or failing to develop language. But I just wanted to show you a bit of behavioral data to um, show that this is not the explanation to this data. Um, so on the same day as the FNIRS, we also ran the Mullen scales of early learning with these babies. We were a bit worried at first because we thought this scale is really designed with hearing babies of hearing mothers in mind. And it includes things that are very unnatural in a deaf family, for example, calling names from behind, see if the baby turns around. Um, so we thought they would underperform and that we wouldn't know how to explain that, but we were really surprised to find the other way around, actually. The babies with deaf moms are significantly underperforming, uh, overperforming compared to the other two groups on that scale, which suggests that probably their experience of interacting with deaf and hearing people is somehow boosting their communicative skills early on. Um, and then we followed these uh, babies through questionnaires, uh, through the post, um, and then at age two, 
Um, so here, this is a, a questionnaire. So this is the CDI, the English CDI. So this is only looking at their vocabulary in English. So as we would predict, um, the unimodal bilingual are, are, are showing uh, less vocabulary in English because their vocabulary is shared between English and another language. Um, but now if we look at the bimodal bilinguals, we can see that as bilingual, they're performing exceptionally well. Uh, almost to the same degree as the monolinguals. So taken together, this all suggests that in the absence of a language deficit in this group, uh, we did find um, different patterns of brain activation in the three groups of babies. So the three different language experiences were, were associated with different uh, patterns of brain activation. Um, there was also um, a lot of consistency in the group effects between language modalities, which suggests something a bit amodal about uh, language activation in infancy. Um, so all of that together suggests that there are many different neural paths to um, a, a proficient language development in infancy. So I would like to thank uh, all the many collaborators on this study and the funders, and also uh, you for your attention and the, the organizers of the, this fantastic symposium. Thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much. Um, this um, population is indeed very fascinating. So putting your talk together with Dan suggests that maybe uh, one thing you did not mention is specifically the experience that the mm -hmm. three groups have, right? So uh, bilinguals come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and so you did um, talk a lot about the mod modality, but not their, the quantity of the exposure that they get, both bilingual groups to each of these languages. And so vocabulary size in particular would very strongly correlate with that. Um, so I, I was wondering whether you looked at your data in that um, detail. Same for the signers. So you said in some families, both parents are, are, are signers. In other families, that's not the case. Do you see, I mean, I, I know you don't have really huge groups, but did you sort of look into um, the, the, the quantity of exposure to all of the languages to see whether that explains some of the underlying pattern. Yes, we have um, a, a detailed interview with each family about language exposure. Um, so who's using what language, how much of it, how, mu how much time they spend with the baby. Um, w one thing that I can say is that it varies enormously, um, especially in the, in the deaf, uh, so bimodal bilingual group where, um, so th they have even more possibilities of mixing and, and, and matching the, the languages than the spoken bilinguals have because a lot of the moms are actually producing simultaneous speech and sign for their, because they know they have hearing babies so they're, they're producing English as well as BSL simultaneously. Um, we also have uh, videos of parent-child interaction that we're uh, planning on analyzing in this way as well for a bit more information. My idealistic project was to um, split them further into groups in terms of um, who's more dominant in sign, who's more dominant in speech, but it, it turned out not to be possible with the, the numbers that we have. I have a nearsy kind of question, which is, you know, one alternative hypothesis to finding sort of no lateralization in the bimodo bilingual group is just that in general it seems like you're getting less activation in that group. Yeah. Just ballparking, you know, looking at it. I'm wondering if you've done any kind of measures to look at signal quality or if you think you're getting less activation in that group in particular. Um, and wonder if that can explain the differences. Um, there was no obvious differences in terms of signal quality, in terms of trials that are included, for example, or, or the amount of noise in the data. Um, and also my group with the strongest activation is monolinguals, but that activation is also not lateralized. 
um, in the posterior temporal region. So I think it's an interesting suggestion, but I, I don't think this is the, the full story here. Thank you very much, very in intriguing. And um, I would like to ask you to speculate on the on this um, decrease activation or less activation and whether this is meaningful at all. And as you mentioned uh, to in the reply to the question to Judith, that actually these infants have uh, both spoken language and sign language exposure. So would you predict that if you expose them simultaneously to spoken language and sign language uh, together, then um, it might be that you observe, you observe a different kind of activation. And the second question is, um, how much uh, sign language, how, much, how easy is to generalize across uh, speakers the sign language for a baby? So these were, this was a mother, right? It was not the mother. Do you think they would respond differently to the mother's signs or whether it could play a role? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, actually. If we were to present them with their mother's speech, no matter what it is in terms of mixing modalities or, or not. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting suggestion. Um, and yeah, perhaps we would see increased activation in this case. One thing that we noticed that was very surprising was that um, so we have looking uh, criteria of six, so only the trials where the babies are looking uh, for 60% of the trial were included. And our babies with deaf parents were a lot more likely to, um, to miss trials uh, based on uh, visual inclusion criteria. Uh, for sign language. So it looks like they were specifically looking away during sign language more than the other groups who had no experience of it. Um, and going back to the parent-child interaction videos, I noticed that a lot of the babies that were doing that, looking away during sign language, were actually the ones with a mom that speaks in sign at the same time. So as if they were seeing that as an incomplete signal. Um, so, uh, yes, I think your suggestion is really interesting. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs>